Welcome to Analyst Talk with Jason Alder. It's like coffee with an analyst, but there's no actual coffee. Each episode, we interviewed an expert in the field of law enforcement analysis to share their career-defining stories and to get their insights on the world. Please join us on recognizing and learning from these brilliant minds as we define the law enforcement analysis profession one episode at a time. Thank you for joining me. I hope many aspects of your life are progressing. My name is Jason Elder, and today our guest has 12 years of experience as a crime analyst with the Scottsdale, Arizona Police Department. His achievements include providing analytical support for Super Bowl 49 and being chosen as Civilian Employee of the Year in 2011 by his police chief. He is a former president of the Arizona Association of Crime Analysts. He is a CrossFit coach, snowboarder, a video gamer, and a beer enthusiast. Please welcome to the show, Mike Winslow. Mike, how are we doing? Good, Jason. Thanks. Thanks for having me on. So how is life under the COVID quarantine going for you? Uh, it's, it's going pretty good. Um, we're kind of almost back to normal, what, whatever that normal actually is, right? Uh, they, they've had us kind of doing a, a combination of work from home and in the office. Um, we've been kind of rotating in and out, uh, but the bulk of the work has still been done at home. And it's, it's definitely been interesting to see how, uh, luckily for us, how seamless that actually had been. Um, our agency already kind of had us set up to be able to work in the field if we needed to. So already had us on laptops, air cards, access to everything that we could get in the office, stuff like that. So uh, the only problem that I really had was finding some monitors in a docking station so I could have kind of the same setup. Very good. That is a blessing because not many police departments, or I shouldn't say not many, but some police departments don't allow their analysts to have remote access. So right. it's good. I guess you never quite leave the office, which is a curse a little bit. So I guess in a way it's a, both a blessing and a curse. It is, especially once they kind of, you know, they, they got your phone number and they know that, you know, even though you're not working, you could still kind of do it. And so I always kind of, they, they got used to hearing this from me of, is this a want or is this a need? No. And uh, that it, it's a good way to kind of keep that balance. And they understand, you know, uh, that they're not going to try to bug you on your day off. But if there's truly something that's important, I mean, you know, we're we're a support service, right? We're, we're there to help the investigators and, and officers. So if there's something that is crucial that's needed, I mean, yeah, I'm going to jump at it and, and definitely help them out. Good. So let's get into some of those services. What what type of analysis are you getting into? Uh, so for Scottsdale, for our crime analysis unit, um, within the last couple of years, they combined our our crime into our crime and our intel into one. So we do a mixture of both crime analysis and intelligence analysis. Um, we are housed it under our investigative services bureau. So our primary um, customer, if you will, is going to be our detectives. So we're assisting in investigations. So anything that uh, pertains to the investigation and things that they need for that in terms of, you know, digging through and finding uh, reports that, that are going to be related to similar suspect case clearance stuff. Uh, and then some of your intel things as far as uh, intelligence workups on an individual. So, you know, if they only have a phone number and then they need us to just dig on that number and find everything that we can on it, that we're doing that kind of stuff. On the crime side, you know, we're still looking at all of the crimes that are occurring in our city that can be attributed to different patterns and trends and putting out, you know, bulletins and different things to our patrol officers so they know what's going on there. And Arizona is kind of unique, I've noticed, in talking with other agencies across, uh, you know, U.S. And, and even across the world. We have a really good established network of analysts and um, we communicate really well. So keeping that communication up because the way that anybody that's been to Arizona and the, the Valley Metro area, you know, you say you're from Phoenix, but you know, you live in Glendale or you live in Scottsdale, you live in Tempe, you can get anywhere in about 15, 20 minutes, as long as the traffic's not bad. So, you know, the criminals don't really follow the borders of the city. So it's definitely important that we keep that communication line open. So with the merger of the crime analysis unit and the intelligence 
analysis unit. Did the crime analyst unit join the intelligence analysis unit? So they all, so before the crime analysis unit wasn't under investigations, but now is, or was it the other way around? Uh, yeah, you're right on the first way. So we, the crime analysis unit at, at the time we were under our, uh, it's operational services bureau is what they call it, um, which is where the bulk of our, um, civilian units are. And, uh, once they, they brought Intel along, it, it kind of <clears throat> made it all into one. And then they put us under that umbrella of investigative services. Now we still did a lot of that stuff in terms of some of the Intel stuff, but it was more to help out. So when they had, you know, if we had a homicide or something large go down, a lot of us, we'd still come together and do it anyway. And in all honesty, you know, from the tactical analysis side, which crime analysis wise, that tactical is definitely where most of our time is spent. If you're doing good tactical crime analysis, you're already doing some Intel analysis already. And so that was kind of seamless for us to be able to go in and we already kind of understood a lot of the elements of, of how to do that and, and adapted pretty well to it. Um, I would say that the biggest thing that that came from us bringing that together uh, would be we did a lot more stuff in terms of on the cell phone analysis side. We, we'd only done a little bit uh, in the mapping, but it's become a, a huge part of, of what we do now. So let's get into that a little bit. The idea of telephone toll analysis, studying the connections between all the calls in Texas, and then you have the mapping aspect of it. Mm -hmm. There's additional analysis. Talk a little bit more about that, please. Yeah, it's 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 awesome to see, and it's it's pretty crazy how how it's evolved over the years. When when I first started, you know, <clears throat> I knew what it was, and a lot of times when it was used you know, you still had people that were using landlines and cell phones. And so you had, you know, calls that were done that way. And the mapping element really wasn't that big of a piece. And, you know, a lot of people don't realize uh, when we get those records for the, the CDRs or the call detail records, really the only reason that those exist for a cell phone company is they use them back in the day for billing purposes, right? Like people remember when you only had a certain number of minutes on a phone or a certain number of texts. They kept track of that and you would get your bill and it would have all of that information. And so we were able to as law enforcement to, to leverage that. And then over the years, as it progressed, they started adding in the actual tower that was being communicated with. And again, not to give that to us to help us, but they were using it to be able to see how well their network was performing and how it was working. Right. So we still had they had that info. We were just able to leverage that to be able to use in our cases. And and I know for us, uh, you know, Scottsdale's a lot heavier on property crimes as far as, uh, you know, your UCR part ones. Um, it's become so prevalent that even the prosecutors now in, in just your standard kind of property crimes cases are asking, well, what do the phones look like? What do the phones say? And, you know, everybody, everybody's tied to a phone now. Everybody has a phone. Everybody uses it. It's, it's almost like our own personal tracker if you will. And there's so much that can be derived from it in, from the analysis perspective. You know, if we get enough of a set of data, you can really establish some pattern of life things and, and, you know, figure out just from looking at it, not knowing anything about the person, where they live, possibly where they work, you know, what time they typically go to bed, uh, who they call first thing in the morning, different things like that. I mean, it's cool and it's creepy at the same time as far as like how how much you can learn just from those records. So with the mapping aspect of this, is it, you know, finding patterns of behavior or is it more identifying a person's step? So they went from here to here to here to here to here, so to speak. Yeah, it, a lot of that depends on on what type of investigation you got going on at, right then. If you're looking on the historical side and saying like, OK, yeah, I've identified this person and now we need to figure out if they were there at the time of our crime, you're going back and, and kind of mapping out that day. Right. And, you know, roughly when the time when the crime occurred, you're looking to see, OK, what can I put the phone in that cell phone handoff area is what we call it, which is like the coverage area of that uh, specific tower on the apprehension side. 
if you're looking to actually, you know, bring this person into custody, you know, then you're looking at it a little bit differently and you're looking at, okay, you know, where are they at usually at this time of day or what does it look like, you know, during the week if, if we're going to go send, you know, a SWAT team out to go hit this house, when's the time to go hit the house? Or maybe we don't know where the house is. So can we figure out where that home tower is based off of the data? Because, you know, you use almost like a density map, right, that you would for crime. That home tower is going to be the most saturated in terms of usage. And um, that's when you can try to identify that and at least hone it down to an area. And then maybe you can do some additional digging through public records or law enforcement databases to go, okay, is there an address in that area that we know that this person could be associated with? So for your part, are you just doing the mapping or are you also studying the telephone toll records? Uh, We do a combination of both. So again, it, it kind of just depends on, on the type of investigation. Obviously, you know, in your, in your drug investigations and things like that, you're going to do a lot more of identifying who they're talking to, who does this number come back to and trying to kind of put those pieces together. Um, some, like, same thing with like a homicide, right? If, if they had talked to somebody right before it happened and we don't know who that person is, then obviously then let's see how often they're talking to that person. Uh, and, and try to establish some type of a relationship there based off of the data. Um, but yeah, I, I would say the top callers as far as like top 10 people that they're talking to and then some of your top times and towers are probably like the biggest things uh, that that we get out of that that actual telephone toll analysis. You mentioned the prosecutor. Have you had to testify on this type of analysis? I have actually. I've, I've testified um, only twice uh, that it actually went to trial. Uh, the first time was particularly interesting because uh, the individual that was being prosecuted decided that it was in his best interest to represent himself at trial. <laughs> nice. Um, so yeah, it, it uh, for it being my first experience in a, in a courtroom, it was definitely different than than any other courtroom. It, it was uh, it was a bit of a circus, and I was already warned uh, ahead of time that that he was a problem, and it, and it was going to be uh, kind of different than what the normal experience would be. Mm-hmm. Um, and then at the same time, his girlfriend was getting tried as an accomplice, and they actually ran them both at the same time. So. After I testified to the stuff that I mapped and the, and the data that I looked at, I got cross-examined by him, right? Because he was representing himself and then by his girlfriend's attorney. And so it, it was a very interesting procedure because, again, I, I had never done it before. So for the first time, it was it was interesting. The, the second time was a lot more standard in terms of, you know, came in, explained all the stuff. Uh, they had actually had uh, some of the map out on a display, um, on a screen. And I kind of explained that and showed, you know, what we kind of derived from the, the raw data, um, that we get in, in spreadsheet form. And then the defense had actually printed out like on like poster board, uh, a couple of the maps in question and, and asked specific questions, uh, when it came to that. And was there any legitimate pushback on the data itself or was the defense attorney just trying to use the maps to paint a different picture. So on the, on the second case, the, the defense attorney, uh, the big thing in that was the, the tower that he was hitting off of at the time, it was a burglary, the tower that was being hit off at that time that put him there, their defense was he was known to that area because he had a buddy that lived over there and he was, you know, working on his motorcycle or something like that. So they were trying to show, well, yeah, he hit off this tower during this time, but he hit off this tower a bunch of other times, too. And really, if you looked at the total amount of the data, it really wasn't that many times to say that, like, this was a good friend and they were always in the area. But it, it was interesting to sh- that that was how they were going to kind of portray it. A lot of times from training that I've had and, and people that I've talked to that have done testifying in court, the defense typically tries to go af- off of... Uh, that the cell phone data isn't accurate and it's it's an estimation, which it is an estimation um, based on where the phone's at. It's not like in the movies where like we can pinpoint accuracy, <laughs> put you, you know, within a meter and go, they're right there. Mm-hmm. You know, um, 
it, it doesn't, it, it's showing the tower, right? And the tower has a coverage of anywhere from, you know, one to over 30 miles, depending on, you know, the areas that you're in and, and line of sight. And, and there's tons of different things that go into how the phone connects to the tower and when it does. And, you know, there's proprietary things that the cell phone companies have that, that have, they have algorithms behind the scenes that we're not even looking at that, you know, you could be sitting in one place on a phone and jump to four different towers during the call just because of the location that you're at and never have moved. But it could look like it on the map that you actually moved if the data shows all of those handoffs that happen because your phone is just looking for the best connection. Oftentimes, it is the closest, but it's also the clearest. We've seen hits off of towers that are way up in the, uh, you know, on a mountain that just because they have just that direct line of sight and that, and that can make it that frequency reaches there that it can hit off that tower and it makes it look potentially like they're really far away, but they're not. Right. And so you have to be able to explain that. Why, why would that happen? You know, why, why does it look like they they're sitting down here and then all of a sudden they jump 20 miles away and then they're back within a minute which is physically impossible. So knowing how that kind of stuff arises and be able to answer those questions, you know, the, when you get the really good data uh, to be able to map out and there, and every carrier is a little bit different in the types of data that they provide and, and things that they give you. Uh, but you can really use that and, and really show it is actually really accurate. Um, if, if you can be able to explain all that. Something tells me that you got a story to tell regarding this. So can you tell the audience how you earned your analyst badge? Yeah, definitely. Um, actually, I'll, I'll be that guy. I'm going to give you two um, mm -hmm. instead of just one. And oddly enough, I know I said earlier how Scottsdale is kind of more property crimes driven, but the, the two are actually both homicide cases. Um, you know, Scottsdale, we only average three to five homicides a year. Uh, so not that many, but we tend to get some very kind of prolific, like major ones. You know, a lot of people uh, may be familiar with Robert Fisher, who still on the FBI's top 10 list. I think they maybe just took him off, um, killed his family in the early 2000s and, and was a survivalist type guy and now is still out in hiding. And we still get tips on the guy. I, I don't know if we'll ever find him or if he's even alive anymore. But one of those cases that we had that ended up being kind of a prolific one and, and it made national news uh, was the murder of, of Allison Feldman. And um, Allison was was really your true victim. Uh, she was a good person, was not in the risky behaviors that that tend to you know go along with people that that get murdered. Um, she was attacked in her home and and very brutally killed. Um, and it was the type of case that bothered a lot of us in terms of just how it happened and that. Once we kind of started in going through everything and, and doing all the work as far as, you know, we, we started from the beginning on that case. We went out on scene and helped provide canvas maps of the area to give the officers that were going door to door and we could mark it off and go, OK, we hit this house. They didn't hear anything. They didn't see anything. So starting there. Right. And then digging a ton deeper into all the calls for service that we got in that area, anybody that got contacted of, you know, we, we thought that the guy may have been close to the area at some point, you know, and we we're hoping we could get catch a break there. We did all that on the cell phone side. We did tower dumps where we're getting information from the actual cell phone tower of phones that connected during that time and trying to identify them back. And, and we struck out there too. And so there was so much work that we had put into it that, you know, the case eventually went cold. And the the one thing that was kind of good and kind of scary was we had DNA that we found at the scene that matched to an unknown profile. And while we had the DNA, and that's always a good thing, the fact that it was unknown, our fear was that we weren't going to see a match on that again until he, he killed somebody else or or something else, you know? We still kept up doing canvases. It seemed like every time we did a canvas, we would catch a little bit more information or a little nugget or something here where we're like, okay, maybe it's this. And where we really caught the break was it actually is going to be the first Arizona case that, that was made uh, using familial DNA. Um, we, the state 
okayed it. Allison's family actually was crucial in, in helping get the legislation passed to get that done. And um, once we ran that uh, for the familial DNA, and there's a lot of stipulations in Arizona for you to be able to actually reach that level to be able to run it. So you can't just do it for everything. We got a hit back and they said, it's, it's a close enough match that it's likely a sibling. And it ended up being our suspect's brother that was in DOC. And once I still remember the call that I got from our sergeant that told me, Hey, we, we know who the killer is. And it, it was, you know, one of those kind of chilling moments of like, Oh man. And, and then from that point, our direction shifted obviously to the suspect, right? So then we started digging in on that guy and figuring out everything we can started following him around and it was really, it was really cool on the, on the day that he got apprehended, they had me out on the scene of the search warrant of his house. And I'm in there providing support to everybody in terms of getting them information, other people to talk to. Once they went to interview him, they actually, I had it up on my laptop. They had me watching it, feeding information to our detectives while it was going on. So literally I have people sending me information I'm texting it to him. I can see them look at their phone and then they're asking him a question. So like in a, in a indirect kind of weird way, like I was helping ask questions of this, of this killer, which was very unique. And it was a cool opportunity to, to have that. And also to be able to provide that closure for her family. Um, because I, I can't imagine how horrible that is to have that loss, but then to not know who did it. And uh, he's actually awaiting trial here pretty soon, and and we'll see how that all goes. But the culmination of all the beginning to end of all of that was was kind of like the biggest uh, you know thing there for me. And then the second one, uh, let me get again, let me ask some let me ask some follow up. Oh, actually, first. actually, yeah, go for it. <laughs> go into a couple of the types of data that you were responsible for with this case. So again, like I was talking about calls for service data was, was a big thing. So we started looking at, you know, uh, different areas and, and we kind of expanded those searches out a little bit, but doing tons of different queries through our data to see what types of calls we had there. Could we have any type of a suspicious person or, uh, you know, that that part of the city had a lot of alleyways that you could get, around places. So, you know, did we have people that were known to the area that, that were a problem or somebody that was contacted late at night, they just didn't have any reason to be there, but you know, they weren't committing a crime. So there wasn't a whole lot we could do about it. Just looking for like that type of, of name. Um, we actually ended up doing phenotype uh, DNA mapping where they gave us based off of the DNA, a list of potential last names that, could be our suspect. Um, and so then we started going through other various law enforcement databases looking for people with that last name that had criminal records that, you know, that could be potentially someone that we need to look at. And oddly enough, his last name actually was on that list of potential people. The reason that we never really had connected him direct, he didn't, outside of some DUIs, he didn't have a huge established criminal history like you would expect. So, so there's a lot, there was a lot of person data that we're looking at there. And then crime side, looking at, you know, burglaries in the area. It, was there anything that, that we could tie to something like that? Or again, just your standard contacts of people that, that were there that shouldn't have been. Very good. All right. But yeah, go ahead and proceed to the second story then, please. So the second one was one of those that uh, there's people that, you know, I've been working with for my whole career that have already had, you know, 20 plus years on that said they've never seen a case like this before and, and probably never will. Um, it ended up being a, a homicide spree type of thing, which which was kind of crazy because, again, we didn't see a whole lot of that. And it, it was very interesting and and cool to see how all the pieces ended up fitting together and, and, and we, I, we were able to figure out who this guy was. The biggest thing was trying to find those connections, right? So there, we had a homicide occur at a well-known counselor slash kind of therapist, psychotherapist office. Um, he did work on John Bonet case, uh, Jody Arias, like all these big cases, pretty high profile dude, um, was killed outside of his office. So it happened on the other side of the street. So it was technically Phoenix, not Scottsdale. 
but we had heard about that happening. It happened at one night and, and they didn't really have a whole lot to go on. The next day, there was a, a double homicide in Scottsdale downtown at a law office, a family law office, not even two blocks from one of our precincts, which was kind of crazy to think of how close that was. And there were, there were two victims. We didn't have any connection between those two victims outside of them working there. But again, family law, that could open it up to a lot of different things. And we got called out on the scene to work right there to help out and, and start establishing, okay, who could this possibly be? And then Phoenix ends up showing up and saying, hey, we think ours are connected to this same one. And, and, and we weren't sure why at the, at that point, but, you know, we, we helped, we started working with them and, um, we were able to get, uh, the shell casings from both scenes put into Nibin very quickly and were able to establish, okay, this was the same gun for sure. We have the same guy. So we knew that. But again, what was the connection there between those two? And, you know, a law office isn't going to be very forthcoming with going, hey, here's everybody that we serve. You know, there's attorney client privilege stuff. So it's not like we could just go through everybody, all the records and try to figure it out. Real quick, we Mike, much, real quick, yeah. Mike, what's what's Nibin for those that don't know? Oh, uh, so Nibin's a, a, a database that a bullet or shell casing, when it strikes and hits out the gun, it makes almost like a fingerprint. It's unique enough that to say this gun fired that bullet and they have a database of all of those. And so you can take those shell casings, submit them through, and they're able to potentially match it up with, with a specific gun, or at least be able to say that bullet was fired from the same gun. So it, it links a lot of different cases together. And I'll just one um, more, more question. Yeah. When you when you say you, you get called out, are you physically, you personally going out to the scene with a laptop and running data? Is that what you mean by going out to the scene? Yeah. Yep. So uh, it, it's not very common and it's usually only on like a high profile like this where we're actually getting called out to the scene. Um, we have one of those big command van trucks that expands out and, it, and there's a a big... Uh, table in there and, and, and we, we set up shop in there and, uh, detectives are able to just come in and out and, and let us know what they need and, and we can run stuff literally right there on the spot. So yeah, it doesn't happen a ton, but, uh, when it does happen, it's, they find it very helpful to have us right there just to be able to be like, Hey, can you run this? Hey, I need to, I need to check up on this and can you check with this or go contact this person? And we end up being a huge kind of information hub where the info is coming in and going out really through, through the analysts there. So. Okay. Yeah. Please continue with your story. On, on that particular night, you know, we were there pretty late and running up a, a bunch of different things and we ended up getting cut loose knowing that we were going to have to come back the next morning and have a meeting with Phoenix and try to figure out all the different intricacies there. And as soon as I'm getting into bed, I get a text from my Lieutenant saying, uh, you're not going to believe this, but we have another scene. <laughs> and we didn't know, but pretty much we found out later that not too long after that double homicide occurred, we had another homicide that occurred at a different kind of counselor's office a little bit further north in Scottsdale. The reason it took so long for that one to come in, he had gotten murdered, like I said, not too long after our other two victims. But it wasn't until his girlfriend called us later and he didn't come home that they went out and actually went to the scene to find him. So he wasn't found until a lot later, but now we have another element and they were able to get, again, the ballistics from that scene in and, and be able to confirm, okay, this, this is the same gun, same guy. So now, you know, we have attorneys and even judges, you know, that do family law stuff kind of on edge thinking that there's this guy out there just coming after them and they don't know why. And, you know, to, to kind of, Wrap it up. There was a lot more that was in that in in this, but we ended up activating our emergency operations center, which is for like natural disasters or or very large scale events where there's a ton of support that's needed. And we had we had the FBI, we had the ATF, all a lot of other valley agencies. We had you know Phoenix, obviously. Um, so we had a lot of different support on the federal and local side. Uh, that were that were working pretty much around the clock to try to find this guy. 
And we were still trying to find the connections of where those places, why were those places targeted? And we focused more in on the people. And it turns out the people weren't the way that we should have gone on that. Um, it was specifically on the locations. We ended up getting a, a tip from what ended up being our suspect's ex-wife and said, I think it's my ex-husband. And I think that because this was the attorney's office that I used, which was where we had the double homicide. The counselor that was killed the day before was the one that did our depositions. And then the third scene, it wasn't the guy that got killed, but that specific office was used for the counselor that interviewed their son. So it was the only place that we could connect all three of those places. And once we started getting info on him, we ended up getting phone data on that one as well. And we were able to try to figure out where he was at. And um, the phone data actually led us to our last scene, which unfortunately we weren't, if we were able to ID him just a little bit sooner, we may have been able to prevent that one, but we were able to put him out pretty uh a little pretty far east of of where he was staying um it looked kind of like an anomaly and it called a specific number and we tied it back to a house they sent uh county sheriffs over there and there were there were two more people that were killed and uh at this point you know we were at least luckily on him knowing that we were going to be able to prevent him from killing anybody else but it just was a, a crazy case, and really it was a revenge case for him. He waited over 10 years before he actually started, you know, what he said, exacting his revenge. He had a YouTube channel that he had up that was just hours of him ranting about all of these specific people. We had to listen through that whole thing, jot down all of these people, and try to get info on them so our detectives could go follow up to make sure that they weren't already a target. And a lot of them didn't realize that they were going to be a target. And the wife and the and the kid uh, were actually up north, so they weren't anywhere close. But guaranteed, you know, he would have been or they would have been the the last targets or last, you know, victims that that he had on his list. And it was just a, an insane case. Um, Dwight Jones was was his name. And I mean, if you look him up, they did a Dateline special on it and it's it's truly a, a it was one of those cases where you're just like man it, crazy so what's the time look like for this from the the first victims to the last victims is this just a couple of days so it ended up being a total of three days and over that span of three days uh there were kind of three uh, of us analyst wise that we put in over 70 hours um pretty much and it was a uh, night and day, you know, we were kind of basically just taking naps and and working in shifts to make sure we had people available. And, you know, we were tired, but everybody was, you know, we were working to make sure that we got this guy done. And, you know, I can tell you, even when I took those naps, like I, I wanted to be up and, and actually doing something, trying to, to find a resolution on this. So talk a little bit about specifically within those three days, what kinds of things are you doing to support the investigation? So with that case in particular, um, one of the big things that, that ended up being our, our main task was they opened up silent witness and, and tip line. And our job was to literally vet every single tip that came in. And I can tell you, as soon as they offered a decent reward, the tips that we were getting, some of them, you know, people just looking for money. Some of them were literally as, as good as, you know, Oh, I was at Wendy's last week and I saw this guy cause we had a sketch done from the very first homicide and that's what they were kind of going off of. And the guy would say, you know, oh, I saw this guy at Wendy's last week and it kind of looked like him and that'd be it. No, <laughs> no location. No, you know, and, and literally nothing to work on. And one of the things that was kind of interesting with this case, too, and it kind of shows to the reliability of eyewitnesses, that sketch was based off of an eyewitness that that thought he saw the suspect in the area and leaving. And we had descriptions. It was a, you know, older white male, all these, you know, different features that, that he had. And, and the sketch was was good. Our suspect was was a black male. There was there was a lot of. Uh, pushback at one point where 
when we had him identified and we knew that he had connections to all these places, there was, there was one camp that was like, okay, this is the guy. And there were still some other people that were like, no, this can't be the guy because we're looking for a white guy and, and, and this guy isn't. And, you know, and we were like, but, but he's the only person that we can connect to all these places that aren't anywhere close to each other that really have nothing else in common. Like he has to be the guy that we're looking at. And some people were, they were just so held on to that eyewitness. And, you know, a lot of eyewitnesses, especially in times of, of high stress situations, you know, you, it's not that you're making stuff up. It's just the way that you process information completely changes. And what you think you saw isn't always really the case. So this was a prime example of that. And you can show the dangers of you can't put all those eggs in one basket. And I think one of the things that we do well as analysts and, and a lot of our investigators realize it, you know, we tend to think a lot differently than, than the investigators do. And it's really easy to get that tunnel vision or go off of, well, this is always how it's happened in the past. And not to sound too cliche, but analysts are really good at that thinking outside the box. And mm -hmm. we can bring a dynamic to those investigations that where we can go, well, Hey, what about this? And if, if, if we're allowed to, you know, voice that opinion and actually have it heard, um, I think that it's it's good for everybody because it, it gives those elements, especially when you get stuck and hit roadblocks, that can help you get past those types of things. Excellent. Now, a lot of the work that you did involved basically working the leads and running running information through a series of databases. Correct. Yep. Yes. Well, that and then when we got the phone data back, it was running, you know, the phones and seeing that was more uh, looking at the mapping, right? And going, okay, where can we put him at these times? We were able to confirm, you know, he was at those scenes at the time. So again, we knew we were looking at the right person. And then it was trying to find any other stuff, like I said, like the the one that was way out east to go, okay, what was he doing out there? Mm -hmm. Things like that. Once you got the information back from the ex-wife. Are you then like going through basically their whole divorce, trying to identify potential targets? Yeah. So, I mean, we started looking, we actually had, um, they used to live in Scottsdale. So there, we had had a, a domestic violence call that seemingly kind of kicked off their whole divorce. And so, and we actually had one of the sergeants in the room, he remembered going to the call and was like, I remember that call. And, you know, and, and so we already knew that there was going to be some rocky stuff. And, and, you know, she had already told us he, that he had vowed to, to kind of exact this revenge, like he was talking about. And he even said, you're not going to know when it's coming. I'm going to wait for things to die down and I'm going to do this. So, I mean, he was threatening this already when they were going through that divorce. And again, the, the YouTube channel ended up being a big thing because Again, there were there were three different videos that are both an hour long where he goes into specific detail as to why the divorce happened, you know, what happened with it, and then all of the people essentially that he felt wronged him and and that he was going to do something about it. So how many victims were there altogether? Uh so you had a total of six victims. From your position, in terms of analysis, are there any clear lessons learned? Um, I think, honestly, that one of the biggest things that I've found, in, in, in even in both of those cases, actually, is uh, getting the analysts in at that ground level right at the beginning. In the past, we used to kind of get brought in way towards the end, and there was a lot of time that would get wasted of them having to bring us up to speed with everything as far as, okay, here's what we're looking at. Here's all this stuff. And being able to save that time, especially in a crucial type of case, like the, the, the Jones one, when we're working on this guy's actively out killing people, you don't have that time to go through that stuff, but we do a lot better as analysts when we have all of the information. And so I think bringing in right at the, at the get go. Uh, is huge because then we can be, like I said, that information hub where info is coming in through us and going out through us. And that flow is already good and established and you don't have to try to do it on the back end. We're going to take a break. When we come back, I want to talk to you about being a post trainer and I want to get into some of your personal interests as well. Uh, you're listening to Analyst Talk with Jason Elder. We'll be right back. Hi. 
Hi, this is Stacy Belladin. As an aspiring crime analyst, I tried to find any training available to learn. Learn from classes, workshops, conferences, networking, you named it. If I could give one piece of advice, it is to invest in your future. I see many analysts sit out of training not to go to important conferences because their agency won't pay for it. And that happened to me too, but there's nothing that says you can't figure out how to get there on your own. Submit a presentation on your work, and you may find that some conferences will waive your registration. Buddy up in a hotel room to cut costs. Find local opportunities on online training where you don't have travel costs. Just like you budget for a vacation or a child's education, you should do the same for your continuing education. It's worth it. Hi, this is Tony Berger. I want to encourage each and every one of you to refuse to be offended. We're living in a, a world right now where everybody's talking and divided on different issues, and we are on social media, and what happens? invariably is that somebody says or types something that irks us, makes us mad. And I just want to encourage you to not take offense to what other people say. Sniping back and forth at people serves no purpose. And we're back. And before the break, we were talking with Mike Winslow, and he went over two great cases that he worked on and provided support for. Now I want to switch gears a little bit because you're in the unique position where you're actually a post trainer. And for those that don't know what post is, that's police officer standard and training. Yeah, it's it's a cool, you know, opportunity and dynamic to where, you know, we're we're kind of right in there with with our sworn uh counterparts and being able to to learn, you know, how how they are taught to train others. And so, you know, you get a, you get a good feel for that, you know, being in law enforcement, you already get a good feel for, you know, how, how to talk cop is kind of how I like to do it in terms of, you know, knowing how to, to kind of reach those officers. And, and it's a, it's a good distinction to have because, you know, different trainings and things that you put on when you're post certified, you have to do a certain amount of hours of training. So, If you get yourself as a certified trainer, the trainings that you put on can be post certified so that you actually, even if you had, you know, a smaller audience normally, you could potentially get a bigger audience just based on the fact that they can get post credit for their, you know, classes that that they're attending that you're teaching. So what are you training specifically? Um, We do a lot of different um, just kind of basic uh, analysis trainings. And, uh, you know, for specific databases, you have to have access. You have to go through some type of training. So just, you know, how to's on, on some of that. They've even worked us into, um, once, once an officer goes to the traditional academy, um, in Arizona, uh, Phoenix and Mesa are like the main ones where they do the academy. They go through the academy and then they go what's called to post academy which then they come to Scottsdale and learn all of the, you know, municipal codes and, and different things that are unique to just Scottsdale. They've worked us into that post academy where we get to actually come in and go, Hey, this is what our unit does. This is all the things that we can provide for you. And then, and give them a good insight before they even hit the road of, of what we are and how we can assist. It sounds like analysis is really ingrained with the police department, which is probably refreshing to some folks listening to this podcast, because I know there's some analysts that are still battling with legitimacy. Yeah, it's it's really tough. And, and I've talked to a lot of, of analysts, and, and I'm, uh, I'm currently a, a mentor of the IACA, the International Association of Crime Analysts. And I, I can tell you from talking to a lot of people in, in that realm that are that are trying to get themselves in or even get themselves established if they're already in. Getting that buy-in uh, sometimes, especially in in your smaller agencies and even in the big ones, it can be really tough to to really gain that legitimacy. And I can tell you that you know it, it wasn't it definitely wasn't what it is now when I first started. And you know, being able to to get on on some of those cases and be able to kind of more or less show your worth and and really provide like, hey, here's all the stuff that I can do. You know, we end up being able to impress a lot of people and they go, Hey, you guys are able to really provide a crucial service to us. And, uh, and then they, they come back, you know, they, they know to come to you for more stuff. So it's, it's, it's something that we've worked on as as a unit 
again over the years and and it's it's nice that that we're you know at that level now where we are trusted and and even sought after to to gain opinions on investigations of hey what do you think about this you know we have new detectives that start off and the detectives that are already established are coming over and going hey these are the guys you need to go to for any and all information like they are the people and so like that's a really cool feeling for sure got one last question You've been an analyst for 12 years. Has there been any urge to, you know, go on, make more money in the private sector? <laughs> yeah, I mean, there, there's, there's definitely some things that are enticing with that because, like you said, the, the, the money aspect is, is definitely better on that side. I'd be lying if I said I, I wasn't asked, you know, and approached on certain, uh, companies and different, you know, opportunities there. You know, I I love my job. I love what I do right now, and um, I feel like I, there's still some more things that I, I want to do and I want to accomplish. But I could definitely see that jump being made at at some point in my career. I see that you're providing a great service to those in Arizona. So keep on doing great work. Thanks, man. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to switch on and get into some of your personal interests. Uh, you're a snowboarder. So you grew up in Colorado, and when did you start snowboarding? Yeah, so growing up in Colorado, you know, there's so many different places you can go. And, you know, I, I really got spoiled by it. And I actually started as a skier uh, just because that, that's what my dad did. And, and so that's how I did it. And in high school, I, you know, snowboarding was really taking off, and it looked cool. And I'm like, you know what? I want to give this a go. And so in high school is when I first started snowboarding, and I picked it up super quick probably because i was already skiing you know that it's different but there are some elements that are the same and i've never looked back and uh i've got i've been full snowboard since then and it's kind of funny you know i got so spoiled in colorado living in arizona believe it or not there there actually are a couple of ski areas but it's nothing like the rockies it's nothing like colorado so i i don't even try going here i i make the trip to go to Colorado to do it because it's just I've, I've definitely been spoiled too much by the beauty that is ski areas in Colorado. What is your favorite type of snowboarding? Um, you know, I don't, I don't, I'm not crazy like in doing tricks and stuff like okay. you know some of the, the Sean Whites and things like that. Mm-hmm. I I like just kind of your traditional. I, I have a um, I got speakers in my helmet and it's, it's Bluetooth connected and I have some specific playlists that I make. Like music is huge for me too. And I like to literally just throw one of those playlists on and just go on, you know, the longest runs possible that take you all the way down to the bottom and, and you're just, just gliding down that mountain and just kind of doing those S turns back and forth and just cruising. And, and then you get done with it and just like, kind of sit back and like, wow, that was a great run. Like that, that's the best for me. And you're also a video gamer, you know, with the quarantine, I, I saw a lot of the jokes <laughs> saying video gamers have been practicing their whole life for being <laughs> right? you know, under quarantine. So you I know, and I also know that you're specific to the PlayStation. What, what's your game right now? Oh man, that's a, that's a great question. So it's funny because, uh, because of this, there, there's been, um, kind of a slowdown a little too in, in a lot of new games that are coming out. Um, so I found myself actually, uh, going through and, and replaying old games. Um, you know, like I grew up on them, right? I, I, my first, I had an old school Atari, you know, that had like Pong and Pitfall and all that stuff. And then, you know, uh, was a Nintendo guy forever. I had Nintendo, Super Nintendo. You know, I have both the Nintendo and Super Nintendo classics. So, like, going back and playing those games has been awesome. So, I've, I've definitely done a little bit of that. Um, as far as PlayStation goes, um, I, I, I've replayed a few games. Um, it's funny, like, you know, doing what I do as far as in law enforcement, but, like, the Grand Theft Auto games are actually quite entertaining. <laughs> um, and then, uh, actually, the last, uh, they made a Spider-Man game that was on the PlayStation that, that was phenomenal in terms of just story and, and the graphics in it. Like, it literally was like playing a movie. But you don't think there's any truth to the rumor that one of these uh, video game developers created the virus? <laughs> yeah, I heard I heard that one. I I, I mean, it, it would be good for business for them in terms of, you know, making sure that everybody's staying in and, and playing. And I mean, even Sony got on board. They they offered up some games that people could download for free 
uh, some of the classic games that just to, for people to have something to do, which I thought was actually kind of cool. But uh, yeah, I, there's so many different, different theories out there with that. You're a beer enthusiast, and we don't have much time to talk about this, but I just was kind of curious, what, what type of uh, craft beer do you like the best? Oh, man, um, all of them. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> no, it's, it, you know, there's it, what I love about beer and what I've come to find over the years with it is that uh, very much like wine, uh, you can pair a good beer with a specific type of meal. So really, it just kind of depends on what else you're having. I will say that my go-to would be an IPA, and there's so many different types. But again, it depends on what you're having. If you're having desserts, like a stout or a porter, like it just complements it so much. But the IPA is kind of your good all-around solid, especially in Arizona. You know, out by the pool, give me give me an IPA. Nice, nice. <laughs> all right. So I want to do a special segment with you because we're both big fans of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. So oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to set a timer and we're going to take 10 minutes and we're going to totally geek out about the MCU. So I love it. for those that don't want anything spoiled or don't care about the MCU, you can just fast <laughs> forward 10 minutes and listen to the rest of the podcast. So I'm setting a timer right now. I'm setting a timer right now. And so let's, <laughs> let's get into, you know, Avengers, how it ended, and just your perspective of how how it all ended thus far. Man, so it's funny because like at at the core, like I'm actually I'm a DC guy. Like mm -hmm. I Superman and Batman are like my jam, and Marvel, and I, I mean Spider Man's right after that, so Marvel's right there with it. But they did such an amazing job uh, on this universe, and I mean Endgame. Like, it still gets me. Like, I'll throw it on and, and like, I almost have to kind of prep myself for, for the way that it's going to end, like, that final battle and the build up to it. I mean, I was in, I was in the theater opening night and it was one of the, you know, few times where I got like that old school feeling back when I was growing up and going in, in theaters where everybody was just losing their minds, you know, and just cheering like, you know, when, when Captain America gets the hammer like <laughs> I, I mean everybody like I literally like i lost it i was like ah! like it was like nerd central right there that was just amazing yeah that, absolutely that is like the <laughs> moment and oh the, yeah the russo brothers actually snuck into theaters and oh did they yes opening night <laughs> they actually snuck in and we're in the back and they just had a big smile on their face because the, every they saw a couple of different shows. And that was always uh, like the climax of everybody, like people almost it, just jumping out of their seats. When, it was amazing when when that part happened. So that was definitely fantastic. Yeah, it was yeah. just well, and it was cool. I've even seen some videos come out even not, not too long ago where they're showing audience reactions to that part. And sure. then. You know, and then Iron Man's part right at the end, which I heard Robert Downey Jr. actually added that in himself, the I am Iron Man part, which how great was that? Because that's how it ended the first Iron Man. And then that's how you end the last of the Avengers for that part of the MCU. Like it was it was full circle. It was phenomenal. Yes. Yeah. They had a couple of different versions. So that, and that's what's kind of come out all since then is all these different yeah. versions, all these different ideas. And, yeah. and whatnot. Uh, what, yeah, they knocked it out of the park. You know, when, and we had talked about this a little bit. The Hulk was my biggest disappointment with the whole thing. And I just didn't like the, the way they did Hulk, even yeah. at the end of Infinity War and everything. Because when you talk about growing up, I grew right. up in, with the Incredible Hulk, with the cartoon yeah. and all the different <laughs> mo movies, even Bill Bixby's, the series that went back in the 70s. I'm showing my age there. So, so the Hulk was, was something I was really uh, wanting to get. He some. was kind of the, the, the forgotten character, right? Yeah, like they, they, yeah. they kind of made him, they kind of made him that, like the first Avengers, they made him a badass, like Hulk smash, like, and then, you know, and he just went and did it. And like, that was cool. But like, you're right. In Infinity War, they kind of made him just so passive and, and, like, I mean, I, I get what they were trying to kind of do with it, but it just, it, it didn't, 
you didn't get that satisfaction of, you know, when, when he's throwing Loki around in Avengers, like that was, that was amazing. You just, you know, <laughs> and Plus, you know, Thanos took care of him so quickly. I mean, yeah, it just, he just, he just kind of just like threw him off to the and side. I was like, what is that? <laughs> and yeah. you know, they wanted the Russo brothers did film scenes where Hulk and Bruce Banner figure it out at the end of infinity war. But they thought, well, geez, everybody's on a down and he ends up on a high. So that's why right. they switched it around. And actually there's filming of, of Hulk, him finding himself and within Wakanda and figuring that balance out between Bruce Banner and Hulk. And I actually wish they would have kept that because I think yeah, you his, know- his arc is would have showed that. You know, for as much as he wants to be part of the team and on the same level, he's not. Mm -hmm. And he can't fit in. And I thought that would have showed perfectly he can't fit in. And then with Endgame, I would have liked to see when he does the snap, like Mm -hmm. he snaps as Bruce Banner, goes into the zone, you know, that, you know, the, the hope zone there. Yeah. And, and then... There's that talk between him and Bruce Banner, but when he comes back, he's just totally out of control. World beat just Hulk, crazy Hulk. To yeah, the dude, point, that would have been <laughs> yeah to the point where you know Doctor Strange has to send him, just has to send him away. You know, and <laughs> that would have been phenomenal. Again, everybody's more there to mourn Tony Stark, and right. he's not even anywhere to be found. That again, a huge disconnect. But you yeah, know, dude, I, I, I mean. I'm, I, I honestly, with all of that, because I had heard that too, I, I would have been fine if they would have made that into its own trilogy as far as the Infinity War kind of saga and had um, an, an, another one that was, you know, Endgame, that was a, another part where they could have gone into some of that stuff. And then you had the stuff with, uh, there was a scene that I saw with, with Tony's daughter later on. Yes. Um, and like that, that would have been cool to add in. And, you know, even explaining the everybody had to Google who the kid was at the funeral <laughs> yes. that they just showed out of nowhere because everybody's like, well, who the heck is that guy? And then you look it up and it's the kid from Iron Man 3 and you're like, oh, well, that makes sense. But like nobody knew who he was because he was so much younger then. And, you know, so they, they would have had a little bit of time. And in all honesty, that that could have been a six hour movie and I would have been in. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. They there was so much. There was so much to go over, and I'm still holding out for Hulk. Hulk's, Hulk still has a story to be told, and they're even making yes. um, She-Hulk is going to be a yep. series on Disney+. Saw that. Plus. And so I still think we have more story to tell, so hopefully Hulk gets a little bit of a redemption uh, moving forward. And, you know, speaking of that kid from Iron Man 3, one theory I read out there is that he's going to go on to be part of a young an Avengers initiative that yeah, they I, might I heard, be trying to I heard to something develop. about that too. So, and that could be cool. I mean, with Disney doing all their stuff, man, like they you know they're going to put the time into it. I'm I'm excited for for the, you know, uh, Falcon and Winter Soldier and and WandaVision and some of the and Loki, like all the all the series that they got planned. Like, I mean, I got Disney Plus just for the series, you know, the Mandalorian was what they started with, which is a totally different universe, but like I'm a nerd <laughs> across all things. So like, yeah. that was awesome. And so, you know, uh, the Marvel stuff, it seems to be really good, but my, what I want to see, especially with the next Dr. Strange being opening up the whole multiverse thing. Um, and the fact that you have Sam, Ra- Sam Raimi directing it. Um, I want, I want a Tobey Maguire cameo <laughs> as a Spider-Man from a different universe, which I've, I've heard that it, it's a possibility, but it, you know, or even a, a live action into the Spider-Verse because that movie was phenomenal and they did such a good job on that and the way that they did it. It would be super cool because now that you've had, you know, three different actors in the movies play Spider-Man, that, that would just be cool, especially as, you know, cause I said Spider-Man's another one for me that, that, it was a, a big love. <laughs> yeah, the the multiverse is interesting because they've teased it so much, but they haven't actually showed it showed us yet. Yeah. And one theory I I read online, and man, this would be awesome. 
The theory is that when Thanos did the second snap where he destroyed all the stones, he cre- yeah. he actually created the multiverse. And he did it. Yeah, so and they kind of almost alluded to that in the last Spider-Man. Yeah. That that there was going to be that and you thought that and you know in the way that they explained it um when when Hulk goes to get the the stone for that like it almost looks like that would be a way to go and that I mean it's a seamless way they can do it. Yeah, and that would basically mean that he knew that by doing this he, there would be versions of himself spread throughout. So even if they someday did kill him right. there would be other versions of him and he'd have a way to keep his yes. his and they also, type of thing going yes and they also said that you know that like kang the conqueror who is a big multiverse oh. bad guy yes. is that yep. he he would have developed him so it's basically kind of passing the torch from thanos to the next bad guy and that that could be that could be awesome, and, and even with them bringing in uh, Jared Leto with uh, Morbius, you know, there's a huge uh, multiverse thing there because you know he essentially hunts Spider-Man throughout the multiverse. So they're definitely setting stuff up for it. Man, there is so much to get into. <laughs> <laughs> it's, such a bummer. it's such a bummer that you know black widow's been delayed now they're all delayed and I was oh like, i know oh. i was ready for that one too man i mean that and then even the uh the new wonder woman looked awesome yeah yeah well that's our 10 minute mark so i you know <laughs> wow you know people <laughs> <laughs> for those that skipped you you know you, you, we're not going to warn you know we're not going to ruin anything for you but uh for those that stuck <laughs> along they're like man those two guys are geeks <laughs> that's for yeah. sure <laughs> there, there's the nerds <laughs> <laughs> very good mike hey so i leave the show with a segment called words to the world this is where i let the guest have the last word so you can promote any idea that you want, but what are your words to the world? So I'm going to go with the one that I go with a lot of times now. Um, I had a, a very close friend of mine that we lost to, to cancer a few years back. And when he got diagnosed, it really changed his perspective on life. And he adopted the the motto of, of be better today. And that's, a, that's what I, I like to leave people with. And it can be anything you want and, and that's being better in, in, in all aspects, right? Just in life as a person, as a, as a brother, as a sister, as a father, as a mother, uh, as, as an analyst. So whatever your job is, um, just being better and doing it right now, not waiting, not letting the petty stuff and, and little things get you down. Very good. Great message. Thank you so much. I'd like to leave our guest with, you've given me just enough to talk bad about you later. And <laughs> I appreciate your time and you be safe, Mike. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. It was really fun. Thank you for joining us today on Analyst Talk with Jason Alder. We hope you not only enjoyed the show, but also learned something new. For more information on our guests and information relating to today's topic, please visit our website at leapodcast.com. Special thanks to the Rough and Tumble for our theme song. For more of their music, you can visit their website at theroughandtumble.com. Also thanks to Kyle McMullen for our show logo. For more of his design, please visit his website at moderntype.com. The show is hosted, recorded, and edited by Jason Elder and written by me, Mindy. You can contact us both via the LEA podcast website. Please join us again next time as we interview another expert in this great field. In true MCU style, I thought we would do a post credit scene. Not only doing a post credit scene, but I'm actually going to throw a monkey wrench into the whole concept of post credit scene because I want to talk about the DC universe as they announced this past week that Justice League, the, the Zack Snyder uncut version, is going to be made by HBO Max. For those that don't know, Zack Snyder was the original Justice League movie director. He had a tragedy in the family, had to step away. Josh Whedon comes in, finishes the the movie. The movie 
gets a lot of bad reviews and a lot of questions about what was really going on. And there's been talk over the years of the Zack Snyder cut. And it's now, I guess, going to become a thing in uh, HBO Max. Mike, I just wanted to get your perspective first on the original movie, and then we can talk about what you, you're expecting out of Justice League on HBO Max. What was your opinion of the first movie? So, as I kind of said before, when we're talking comic stuff, I, I'm at heart a, a DC guy, and like Superman is is at my top number one. One of the first you know movies that I ever watched was the Christopher Reeve you know Superman movie, so I was kind of sold from that point. So seeing him in any movie is always a treat for me. Um, I will say with Justice League, having known that it was two different directors, you know, kind of maybe influenced this a little, but it really did feel like there were two different kind of movies going on. And I don't know. I know that, that when, when Joss uh, Whedon came in, he, he did a lot of rewrites and reshoots, which was the whole mustache gate where they had to take Henry Cavill's mustache digitally yes. out and <laughs> caused all that. And, but you, you could almost, at least for me, like, I could almost tell there, like, certain parts that felt like they were kind of added in. And then, you know, if you read up on some of the things prior to them announcing they were going to make this cut of things that didn't make it in the movie, you know, like, there was, like, zero backstory for Cyborg, which apparently this cut has a lot more. Like, they kind of just threw him in as a character and you didn't really know anything about him. And, I mean, they did that in the Avengers to an extent that not every character got their own, you know, movie beforehand, but you still at least got some backstory. It felt like that kind of got cut. You know, some, I know there was a lot of debate around kind of how they did with the flash and, and made his character a little different, but he also never got really any kind of backstory as well. So it, it was definitely lacking on some of that. You know, personally, I thought all of the, Spoiler alert if you haven't watched any of these, these <laughs> you know, they, they kill off Superman and, and Batman vs. Superman and bring them back for Justice League. Those comics, that whole series of that was probably some of my favorite that I ever read growing up. And they rushed all of that so much. They could have done three movies on just the death return of Superman, like all of that. And it kind of got thrown in and just kind of, you know, oh, hey, now he's back. And I, I did like that they kind of lightened up the character a little bit in the sense that Superman, you know, he's not Batman, right? He's not the dark mm -hmm. brooding type. <laughs> mm -hmm. And they at least kind of tried to make it back for him to have fun. It tried to bring in some of that stuff that, that worked with the Avengers, but it, it didn't feel complete. Cause like I said, it, it very, it felt very disjointed, but that being said that, you know, there were elements that I like, I, I do actually like all of the casting moves that they made for that movie. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Henry Cavill is, is phenomenal as Superman. And I, and I really hope that with this, that there's going to be a resurgence to bring him back and, and let him get a chance at getting a sequel. I know uh, Ben Affleck's already said he's out and, you know, he kind of gets his own crap just for who he is. But <laughs> as far as like someone from the comics, like he looks like Batman straight out of the comics. Like he has the oh, yeah. stature and the presence. And I like how they modified his voice via technology right is how he did it as opposed to you know christian bale was was awesome as batman he overdid it a little bit with the voice thing mm -hmm. and so i, I kind of like i like how they did that part of it you know i was okay with them having kind of the flash be the the comic relief um and i know that actor has gotten in his own trouble and now that like they're talking about replacing him. So <laughs> well, there's, that's saved, kind of a mess. Flash saved the movie for me. Like, he was, yeah, he, he, I, I love the, the way that he did it. And in all honesty, when I first heard he was cast, I, I really didn't like it. Um, mm -hmm. I actually, I really liked the kid they got playing him in the, the TV series. Mm -hmm. And I knew they weren't going to make that, uh, you know, make him that crossover like that. But I was like, man, I don't know how that's going to work. But he, he worked out great in it. And he, he was really funny. And. I, it was different than what I was expecting. And, you know, and then Aquaman, I always tell people this all the time, that one thing where they succeeded was they made Aquaman cool. <laughs> and it's like Aquaman, like out of all of them, you know, he's the most lame. He doesn't have any, he's like, you know, he's not as cool as the others. They cast him perfectly, picked a, a awesome dude to play him. And, and like I said, they made him cool. Yeah. And then Wonder Woman, um, it's same thing. You know, she she's phenomenal. She she fits that role just perfect. I think part of why they're they're maybe giving this a shot too is you know both Wonder Woman and Aquaman um, actually did 
very well in terms of perspective on their own. And so, you know, I think HBO is also trying to kind of get something big to kind of drum up their, their new streaming service. And oh, sure. that's always been one of those things where it's like, it's been out there. And I read an interesting article of the precedent that they, that they think it's a dangerous precedent that's being set. Cause especially movies that have that big backing, like, like your Star Wars and, mm-hmm. and things like that, you know, there's been tons of stuff on, on those that people want to see, you know, JJ Abrams version that he was, uh, he had and, and all this different stuff. So like they're, they're afraid it's going to open the door for that. They're definitely throwing some money at it. I saw there's, they're putting like 20 to 30 mil into it. So, so, so that sounds to me like they're actually going to do reshoots. And I, I, were... I can't see how they, they couldn't, right? Like there's going to have to yeah. be some stuff that, that didn't get shot because the movie wasn't finished when he stepped away. Sure. Uh, but I know. You know, supposedly there's it, it's a solid like four hours. So they're talking about breaking it up. <laughs> sure. I mean, there's one thing that that Zack Snyder is known for. It's longevity and or you know length of movie that mm-hmm. you know the story will be told and and he has no problem taking a long time to to tell it. And it's interesting when you talk about, you talked about the the reviews. You know, I feel like part of the reason that it didn't do well and got canned kind of immediately was because the MCU was doing so well and they're kind of, it's very formulated in the way that they did it. it. Because it was different than that, there was just some automatic pushback of, well, this isn't what we're used to. And so they kind of just, it, and a lot of people just wrote it off. You know, Batman versus Superman, if you actually watched like the director's cut version, not the one that was in the theaters, <laughs> the the issues that people had with that movie are addressed a lot in that director's cut version because uh, whoever edited the one that made it in the theaters uh, did a horrible job on it because it jumped around so many times. And uh, again, that one had so much packed into it also, mm-hmm. but you know, and it, I mean, that one's clocked in it over three hours of the director's cut, but it, it has so much more in it. And you see how Lex Luthor was really very much the puppet master there in pinning them against each other. Where they, I mean, they have that in it, but you don't see it as much to the extent as if you were to watch the director's cut. So I, I really am interested to see how his vision is is going to go on this. And honestly, the thing I'm probably most excited to see is them adding in, and I don't know how much he's going to be in it, but uh, Dark Side, which you know, Dark Side, he's even worse than Thanos in terms of just his presence and and just bad guy. <laughs> And the actor, I guess, that played him already, like, they've already, he was able to finally say, like, oh, hey, I'm the guy that played Darkseid in Justice League, even though he wasn't in it at all. So I'm curious how they're going to do that, because, you know, in, in Batman vs. Superman, they made the that nightmare sequence where you see Superman actually, it seems like either he's being brainwashed or controlled, right, where he's he's actually bad. And it's a dream sequence, but it very much you you see the the Omega, you see the stuff that that that's all around Darkseid. So he obviously plays a role in doing that. And even though they kind of made Superman when they revive him, so to speak, in in Justice League, initially kind of bad, they just made it more of he just was trying to he didn't remember who he was. The dark side element, and then I'm hoping they teased before about the the black suit that Superman has when he comes back to life in the comics. They said that that suit exists and that he was in it. So uh, those are two things that I want to see, like, in this version. Oh, very good. Well, I hope you get to see what you <laughs> what you want out of it. It's, it's going to be interesting how they do it, if they skip parts or if they're just going to try to morph the two concepts together. I, I'm yeah. not exactly sure how it's going to look, but it looks like Zack Snyder's going to get his day. So his speak. wishes. <laughs> well, so. and if anything, you know, honestly, dude, I, I'm I'm going to be glad that we don't got to hear about it anymore. Unfortunately, it seems like DC's always been kind of marred, and either they they really knock it out of the park with like the Dark Knight trilogy, or it gets kind of muddled into Batman vs Superman Justice League stuff, where people just I think now it's got kind of like that stigma to it that that's why they're trying to kind of restart if you will but they're keeping some of the same actors you know so we'll see how it goes but it's definitely being done very differently than than the way that marvel went about doing it that's for sure sure all right well we'll see thank you for your time (laughs) appreciate it (laughs) thanks